Okay. Welcome back to Interventional Medical Image Processing. <laughs> so today we will do a short refresher because it seems that uh, a couple of you have been visiting the Bergkirchweih and there seems to be also a couple of people who can't attend today because they did the Big Bag Certificate. Does everybody know what the Big Bag Certificate is? A großer Bergschein. Uh, this is when you go to the Bergkirchweih every day and have at least one mass of beer. Then you get the Big Berg Certificate. Uh, well, you're, not, you're no longer in the first semester, so uh, you don't have to do the Big Berg Certificate. Who's in the first semester? No. Yeah, but you're in the master semester, right? Yeah. Okay. So nobody really has to do the Big Berg Certificate. If you're in the first semester, you um, well, there's no reason that you actually have to do it, but it seems some students encourage other students to actually do that. Anyway, um, so we've been talking about pre-processing, and you attended the Bergkirchweih only three times, so you still remember something. <laughs> so there were gradients, and then we were talking about the structure tensor. Okay, what else did we talk about? Immediately should come into your mind when you talk about the structure tensor, what was very similar? The Wesselness filter, exactly. Exactly. What else did we talk about? After Wesselness, everything becomes blurry. We talked about image descriptors and multi-resolution. Oh, yes? Yeah, exactly. Edge-preserving filtering. Which methods come into your mind when, I, when we look into edge-preserving filtering? Excuse me? Bilateral filter and? And guided filter. These were the two methods we've been talking about. And then we were talking about feature descriptors, right? SIFT and SURF. I think we mainly talked about SIFT. So let's put SIFT here. And then we were talking about something. Super resolution, exactly. Super resolution. Okay, and I think this concludes our pre-processing. And then we went to the next chapter. And we will call this probably image analysis. And the first thing we did is we did a short refresher course. Ah, okay, we, we also have a couple of tools, right? Tools and the first tool we got to know was the singular value decomposition. We will use that today again. And another tool that we found incredibly, incredibly useful were projection matrices. So projection matrices are really useful because we can use um, a matrix to define, to describe uh, a perspective projection. Uh, in a homogeneous space, which was really useful. And today we will use that um, to uh, talk a bit about image analysis. And the first thing we will talk about uh, will be um, epipolar geometry. Yeah? So we will be talking about stereo camera vision systems today. And one application where you can use that is, for example, magnetic res uh, navigation. So far, we've only talked about image preprocessing, and we were essentially talking about a single image, and uh, we did not use combination of images. Super resolution was a slight exception because then we were using multiple images to compute one big image, uh, one highly resolved image. But now I can use a couple of images and try to reconstruct a 3D 
structure. So from two views, I can reconstruct the 3D point if I have a calibrated projection matrix. And in the following, we will start processing multiple images, yeah? at least for the course here. So one idea that is uh, where you really need 3D information is magnetic uh, navigation. So let's say you have a system like this. Can everybody see that well? Should I turn off the front? So this is already off. Can everybody see that device? So this device is uh, for magnetic navigation. And now imagine you have um, a, a patient on the table. And this patient uh, has a catheter inside his body. And now you have some x-ray projection guidance. And you're moving the catheter. So we, we talked about this earlier, right? So you're moving the catheter through the body. And then you can use this device to use uh, magnetic forces to actually pull the tip of the catheter. So if you want to go into a specific vessel, then you can use the magnetic force to go into the right direction. But if you want to do so, you of course need to know 3D information. So you have to be able to reconstruct the 3D position of the tip of the catheter in order to compute in which direction you actually have to pull because um, you obviously also need um, some structural information in addition. So you also need the vessel tree reconstructed that you know which bifurcation. So if you're at a bifurcation where you can do two ways in the vessel, then you need to know into, in, in what position is your catheter and in what position do I have to pull to get into the right direction. And this is a, um, a system that can actually do this. This is the Niobe system where you have x-ray guidance here, and you have this uh, strong magnet that is able to um, actually influence the navigator, uh, the catheter, and pull it into the, right, uh, into the right direction. So we will not talk about the physics of nav uh, magnetic navigation here, but we will look into, into an interface how to define the direction of the magnetic field. And our idea is that we can reconstruct the 3D position and then uh, find the direction in which we want to pull with the magnetic force. So for example, we can take two views. And then we have the tip of the catheter. And we draw the direction in which we want to pull into the two views. And then we can reconstruct the point and the direction from those two views. OK, if we do that, we define something that is called uh, the epipolar geometry. And here you find the example for, uh, for a usual camera system, but we can draw the same figure onto, uh, onto the board here, where we define this for flat panel detectors. So in the general case, uh, you have or in the x-ray case, in the general case, you can also use, you can actually use the same math as here. But in the x-ray case, uh, you would have a slightly different geometry because you would have two projections. And then you have a source point here and the source point here. And these are the cones that are actually acquired by your uh, x-ray system. And now if you have a point, a 3D point in here, then you can observe this point in this projection and in this projection. So we can do the same here, but uh, observe that the difference between the two geometries here is just the position of the screen. So in our usual camera system, we can describe the system as having the screen right here and right here. So we, uh, we don't have to use a, um, a geometry that requires to cast all the rays right through the object. But uh, essentially, you can describe it using the same math. So in the following, we will stick to this description over here. But in general, it also holds for x-ray projections. And the effect is actually the same. So you have two 
optical centers. This is the focal point of the first camera. This is the focal point of the second camera. And then you have some world point here and your image plane is somewhere here and somewhere here. Yeah, these are the imaging planes. And now, if you consider a world point, then you, this is some point in the scene with a 3D position. And this point and this point, three points in space, they form a plane. So if you take three arbitrary points in space, they form a plane. And here in this case, uh, this plane is called the epipolar plane. And in this epipolar plane is the, re the point of interest and the two camera centers. And now we can define specific points. For example, we can find the point that is the intersection of the world point with the image plane. And this is nothing else than the projection of the world point to the image plane. And we can do the same for the other camera. So here we have the world point and the connecting line with the camera center and the image plane will be the projection of the world point onto the second image plane. Another thing that we can find is the projection of the focal center of the other camera. So this is the other camera and the line that is connecting the two focal centers and the intersection with this image plane. And this is called the epipole. This point is the epipole one in camera one and it's the projection of the other camera center. And this is the epipole of the first camera projected onto the second screen. Okay. Now, you can think about that. This is a line, the, the, epi, the baseline is the line that connects the two camera centers. And now, every epipolar plane must contain this line because all planes, all epipolar planes contain the camera centers. So, the bundle of planes that can be described by epipolar planes must form a pencil around this line. Uh, so if you move your, your source point up and down, your world point up and down, your epipolar planes will rotate about, about the baseline. So the connection between the two camera centers is the baseline, and depending where your point in 3D space is, you will rotate this plane around the baseline. And now we can also do something interesting. We can intersect our 3D plane with the two image planes. And if we do that, we get a line. The intersection, of course, between two planes is a line. And we call this the epipolar line. So this is the epipolar line that is nothing else than the intersection of this plane with the image plane. And now that we know that all of the epipolar planes actually must contain the baseline, all of the epipolar lines must contain the epipole which is the intersection of the baseline and the image plane. Which means that the projection of all of these lines onto our um, projection here must form a kind of star-like structure that contains all. So all of the lines need to run through the epipole. Uh, the epipole doesn't necessarily lie within the image plane. So if the epipole lies far away from the image plane, you get essentially parallel epipolar lines. So if your two cameras are into the same direction and the image plane is here, you will never get an intersection of the camera centers. And in this case, your epipolar lines are all parallel uh, because the, the, there is no intersection between the image plane and the, uh, and the baseline. In this case, you would get just parallel lines on your image plane. Okay, so we found that uh, three points in space, of course, form a plane. We found that this epipolar plane um, is all, can also be projected onto our images here. And in the projection, of course, it forms a line. And this line must contain the epipole or they are parallel if the epipole is in infinity. And with this, we are able to describe a relation between the world point the camera centers, and uh, the projection of the world point. Now, the interesting thing about this is, typically when you have a point in 3D space, then you immediately know 
So let's say I click on one point in projection one. I'm essentially identifying one ray here. So by clicking one point in this projection, by selecting one point in the projection, I'm selecting a ray. And you can think of the epipolar line as the projection of this ray onto this plane. So if I select any point here, I immediately select this ray, but I'm never considering how far the point I'm actually interested in is away. And now the nice thing is, if I have something like a SIFT descriptor, and the SIFT descriptor is similar in both images, then I know if I have calibrated the system and I know where the epipole is, and I can compute this epipolar line, because the line is essentially the projection of this ray onto here, and then the corresponding point must lie on this line. There is no way it could be on a different position other than the line, because all of the three points need to lie in the same plane, and it doesn't matter how far this point is away from the epipole, but as soon as I selected this point here, I'm fixing this line. So if I'm now trying to find correspondences between the two points, and I can only reconstruct the depth of the point if I have identified the same point in the two projections. So if I, in addition, also find this point, then I am able to compute the intersection of this ray and this ray, which will give me the world point. If you're hearing this for the first time, this is kind of complicated, but if you uh, think about this figure and start rotating it a bit, you will immediately say, see it all makes sense. And what we will do in the following is all of the nice properties that we've uh, just described, we will find that all of these properties we can also describe by linear algebra and by the calibration of the system. So all of this, what we've just said verbally, we will also figure out that this falls out of the uh, derivation of our geometry. So in the following, we will define the two optical centers with C1 and C2. And we will consider a world point WW. And of course, these three are 3D points, so they are defined in 3D space. And WW is, uh, is mapped to a point P, and this is now also a 3D point, because we are considering the camera system, the camera coordinate system without the projection. For the time being, we assume that the camera coordinate systems are just uh, coordinate systems that are aligned with the central ray. So our camera coordinate system is aligned with the central ray, and uh, the set direction is along the central ray. So we can find two points, because we have two projections, and we call uh, point P in the left image, and we call the same point Q in the right image. So P and Q are the same world point, but they are the coordinates in the respective, uh, in the respective uh, coordinate systems. Now, the baseline, or the translation vector between the two camera centers will be denoted by T, and E1 and E2 are the epipoles, and they are in, uh, in 2D space because they must lie inside the projection plane. And we can also describe the epipolar lines by L1 and L2. Okay, so let's see what we can do with that. So this is again a description here of the same system. Here is again our world point. And we can see that uh, this is our point. Um, so this is the right image. So this is P and this is Q. And P and Q can be transferred into each other by taking the one point, uh, rotating it, and translating it. So we have to translate by the baseline and we have to rotate by the rotation in between the two camera systems. So they can be transformed into each other just with a rotation and translation. So also we need to define f, which is the, the focal length, but we will only uh, use f as soon as we really consider the perspective projection. And we can also find Q 
C, uh, so QC and uh, PC and QC are the camera coordinates. Uh, so this is uh, the, uh, sorry, did I, oh, okay. P and Q are the intersection points in 3D. So this is not yet involving uh, the camera coordinate system, sorry. PC and QC denote the camera coordinates of the intersection point. So only PC and QC really uh, contain the point that is uh, described in camera coordinates. Now we can also find the uh, respective points on the projected screen, QP and Q, uh, PP and QP, and these are really the 2D points. And they are described in a coordinate system in which the upper left corner of the image is the origin. And now you can also describe the observed 2D points in the image plane where the origin of the coordinate system lies in the central ring. So we have multiple coordinate systems. So we can find one coordinate system that is essentially aligned with the camera coordinate system, which is PI and QI, and it's just the projection. And then we still need the mapping to the pixel grid where the upper left corner is the origin. So we have several coordinate systems involved here. Now I can start with our camera points. So my, we will now stay essentially in relative coordinates. We will not use the world coordinate systems because then I don't have to think about the origin of our world coordinate system. So I can find a rotation between my two camera positions that will map the same point uh, into the respective other point. And this point is the same point in world coordinate system. So you, what you need to do is you need to shift it and then you need to rotate it. So we can find the relation that we can uh, put the two things together just by a rotation and translation. Now the nice thing with the rotation is if I uh, take the transpose and multiply from the left hand side, I can find this relation. So the rotation will cancel out on this side and we'll find the rela uh, rotation transpose on the left hand side. Then we can find another observation. The vectors PC, so PC is on the one side, QC is on the other side, and T is the baseline connecting the two points. Those three lie in the same plane. They are all in the epipolar plane. The baseline is in the epipolar plane and the two vectors connecting the camera centers with the world point are of course also in the same plane. So what I can do is, I can take um, the cross product of T and PC. This will form a vector that is perpendicular. So this will be an out of plane vector. If I take the cross product, it will be a normal of this plane. Now if I have computed this normal here and I compute uh, the scalar product with this vector, then you can immediately see uh, that they need to cancel out this vector and this vector, because this vector is perpendicular, this lies in the same plane, then the scalar product between the two needs to be zero. And this is, this is relation number one, this is relation number two, and now I can take this equation here, so I see that this part and this part is identical, so I can replace this with this part here, so I get R transpose times QC transpose times T um, cross product PC equals to zero, right? This, this needs to be equal to zero. Then I can resolve the transpose. The transpose will, of course, force QC to be transposed and the rotation two times transposed will be the original matrix. So I can get QC transpose times R times T cross product PC equals to zero. And now I can rewrite the cross product here. This is also a linear operator and I can find a three by three matrix to actually describe this operator. This is the so-called skew matrix. So I can also describe this as a matrix, which means that I get a matrix here in between, 
and I can call this matrix E. So this is just the rotation times the skew matrix of the baseline. And now I take the point uh, described in the, in the left camera times the point in the right camera, and it needs to be zero. Huh? So if I do that, this relation describes nothing else that those two points, they are in the same plane. But the nice thing now is this rotation and translation vector, they are fixed with the camera system. So as long as I'm not changing the relation between camera one and camera two, if I fix them to some kind of array, yeah, so, so to some mount, so I mount them on, on some, some kind of uh, stable system, and they never change the position with respect to each other, then these are fixed parameters of the system. So if I find two points that describe the same world point, this relation will be zero. Of course, there is multiple points. Um, if I fix PC and, um, uh, and I try to find the respective QC, I will learn that this matrix is actually only rank two. So there is a multitude of points for which this relation will be true, for which this relation will be fulfilled. And in fact, this is exactly the epipolar line. So if I select one point in the left-hand side, this is exactly what we just described by geometry. This is describing the same thing just by linear algebra. And if I have this matrix E, I can select an arbitrary world point PC, and I can find the corresponding line of points that will form this epipolar line. Good. So another thing uh, that we need to uh, define properly is this skew matrix, and you can find this um, by this matrix here. So it only contains T1, uh, T1, T2, T3, which are the components of our baseline vector. And then we can write up the skew matrix. So this is how you would find that. So if, I, if you know the rotation and the translation, you can immediately compute the essential matrix E. Now you can also think about that you uh, can go to a homogeneous uh, representation of QC. So you can represent it in homogeneous coordinates. And if you do that, you need your perspective projection matrix. So everybody remembers the perspective projection matrix. And if I have a homogeneous representation of this point, I just need to multiply with our uh, perspective projection matrix, and I will get the homogeneous version of our image point in the plane. Good. So if I do that, um, I can see that this relation here also holds true for the homogeneous points. So I can take the homogeneous point and uh, use the essential matrix here in between and the other homogeneous point, and I can also find this relation. So this is very nice. So I can find an, an uh, essential matrix that describes the relation between two homogeneous points in our image plane. Yeah, and this is then called uh, the essential matrix. We remember that in homogeneous coordinates, the cross product uh, of the cross product of points is a line. So you can actually interpret the this cross product here uh, in homogeneous um, coordinates, and this will be a line. Huh? So you can say, if I do the cross product between the, those two vectors, I get a line, which we denote by a row vector. And then we can see if we have a point in the one space, in the one image, one homogeneous point, we can see that if we multiply this point with the essential matrix, we immediately get the homogeneous representation of the line in the other image. So if I select now a 2D point in one projection and I have this matrix, I can immediately compute the line in the other image, just with the essential matrix, once I have calibrated this. And this is now super useful if you're looking for correspondences. And this is what they use in um, virtually all of those um, 
uh, texture-based calibration algorithms. So if you have a stereo system and you have some objects with, uh, which is not homogeneous, so you can't use this if you're imaging a white wall. Yeah. If you look, look with a stereo system onto a white wall, you won't be able to find any correspondences because you find no matching points. But as soon as you have some kind of texture, or if you start projecting a kind of interesting texture into the scene, then you can find um, corresponding points using those apipolar lines. Uh, and then, of course, you can use the, an idea how far points can actually be apart in the scene. So if you limit the, uh, the size of your scene, then you can also make predictions how far the point can be away along this apipolar line. Another very interesting point is, so we can immediately get this line in the other projection image. And another very interesting point is, if you take uh, the essential matrix, transpose the essential matrix, you could rewrite this as R uh, T skew, transpose R T skew. And if you um, multiply the two, you will see that um, and the transpose will invert the sequence, and then you just get a T skew transpose times R transpose times R times T skew, and R is a rotation matrix, so it will cancel out. So all that you remaining have remaining here is the uh, the baseline. So this is the skew matrix transpose the skew matrix, and then we realize that E transpose E is independent from R. So if you compute this term, you get something that is rotational independent. It's only dependent on the baseline. Then you can also figure out that the null space of E is spanned by the baseline. Yeah. Null space needs to be spanned by the baseline. And of course, um, we have a rank of two because we have a rotation matrix multiplied with a skew matrix, and the skew matrix has only rank two. So the essential matrix needs to be ranked efficient. Good. Um, multiplication of the essential matrix by a constant does not change the epipolar constraint. So this is also um, up to scale. So we, if we want to have a unique solution, we typically have to find a normalization. So we can, uh, for example, normalize the baseline to be one, or we could say that the Frobenius norm of the essential matrix needs to be one if we want to get up to a, a unique solution. Yeah, of course, the rank two criterion is something that I already said. Yeah, So it's only rank two. Then we get uh, five degrees of freedom. And you will have two non-zero single values that are identical. And of course, uh, if you take a point that is on this line, it will be zero. And of course, uh, this will hold for the other side, side as well. So if you take a point in the right-hand image, you get the line on the other side and vice versa. And if you find a point that is on that line, the epipolar constraint needs to hold. So if you select a point in the other image, uh, it needs to be zero. OK, so these are very useful properties. So how can we estimate this? Well, we can just go ahead and say, uh, this is all a system of linear equations. And now we just say, well, we, we know this trick that we can uh, rearrange everything into a linear system. So we can rewrite this matrix equation, of course, into this matrix. So this is just element-wise uh, the same matrix. And now we can find that this is linear in the elements of the matrix. And then we can rearrange this system of equations such that um, we get a vector of the unknowns. So we rearrange this equation into a linear form. And if we just write out the previous equation, you see that it's just um, a weighted sum of components of P, K, and Q, K. And then you have your entries of the essential matrix. So for every point where you know that the epipolar constraint is fulfilled, 
uh, you will find, find one of those for every pair of points where you know that the apropolar constraint is fulfilled. You will find um, one such equation. Now, if we have many of those points, we can set up this into a system of linear equations. So I have one equation per line. And I can actually factor out the components of E and rewrite this into a long vector. And then um, all the PK and QK, these are observations that I typically get from a calibration pattern. So you remember the normal camera calibration that we talked about in the last lecture. We can do the same thing here. So I take a stereo vision system and I take a calibration pattern and I click the same points on both, uh, or automatically even detect um, this, for example, a checkerboard pattern, then I get corresponding points, and from the corresponding points, I can compute the essential matrix. Now, you will see that this measurement matrix now looks like this, and this is our vector. So this is one pair of points that fulfills the epipolar constraints, and for every pair of points, I get one line in this matrix M. So this is our measurement matrix. And then I just multiply with a vectorized version of our matrix, where I have the elements of the matrix just in a long vector. And this needs to be zero. So what I need to compute is the null space of M. The, essential, the elements of the essential matrix will be formed by the null space of M. So what can I do? Well. I can find my set of point correspondences, and we call this uh, the Siemens algorithm, because we don't use any of the knowledge we have observed so far. So we just take the previous equation, and we just solve it. So what you do is you read your correspondences, you write them uh, such that you get your measurement matrix, then you compute your singular value decomposition, and you return the last column of V, and that will be your essential matrix. Uh, if we do it this way, we don't use any of the observation that we have uh, observed so far. All the properties of E and so on. All we're using is the null space, is that the null space needs to, null space of M needs to form E. So this is a very simple algorithm. But in fact, we can use all of the interesting properties that we have discovered so far and make this algorithm better. So this is what is called the eight-point algorithm in literature. And it follows, in principle, the same idea. We're still solving the same system of equations. So the first few steps are identical. We read our correspondences, we set up our measurement matrix, and then we compute the SVD. And the first thing that we realize, so um, for example, if our M has full rank, so if the last singular value, we know it needs to be rank deficient because we're looking for the null space. If it's not rank deficient, so if we have more than nine singular values that are greater that, or if we have nine singular values that are greater than a threshold epsilon, we know something is wrong. It can't be. So if you find something like this, and you still compute your essential matrix, you are very certain to have done something wrong. So probably one of our correspondences does not match. Yeah? If, you have a, it, um, if the correspondences don't match, if they're not within one plane, then you will get a full rank matrix here. So if you don't get a rank deficient matrix, then you can just stop because you have identified a set of points that do not fulfill the epipolar constraint. So you should do a warning, or you can do a new iteration uh, of your ransack, because you already found a set of points that does not fulfill the epipolar constraint. If you only have eight singular values, then you really have a null space, and then you really can find uh, the last uh, column of V, which will give you the null space. So now you can read these components and rearrange them into a matrix. Yeah? We, those nine components are supposed to be a matrix. And the next thing that we can do is we can compute again the singular value of E, uh, the singular value decomposition of E, and we know that this matrix needs to have a rank deficiency. And if it if it has full rank, if this matrix has three singular values that are higher than a threshold epsilon, 
um, then you can stop again because this is not a valid uh, essential matrix. So you have something in your data that is not correct and this uh, messes up your measurement. So you need to find out which points actually violate your, um, your epipolar constraint. And only um, if you have a rank deficient matrix, then we can use the next criterion that we observed. We have observed that the two singular values should be similar yeah, because this stems from the rotation matrix. So we take the difference between the first two singular values, and if the difference is too high, then this is not a rotation. Uh, you, have a, you do something that has a skew inside. So you can also say this is not a valid, um, this is not a valid essential matrix, and then you can also stop. And only if you have all these criteria fulfilled, then you can be sure that you have an essential matrix that actually does the trick that you want to do. Still, you have some noise in there, but uh, this for sure helps you to intrinsically determine outliers. Yeah? We don't have to compute the number of inliers and outliers and so on. We can already find this by this algorithm because it will tell you that we have put in something that is invalid and will not return a correct essential matrix. And now, since we have already the SVD, uh, and if there is a slight uh, difference between the two singular values, we can just add the two, divide them by two, and really force the two singular values to be identical. And uh, then we can recombine and, of course, force the last singular value to be zero. And then we can recombine the essential matrix by the decomposition. And now we really have a matrix that has rank two and that uh, is also has two identical singular values. So this is the eight-point algorithm. And of course, this is very similar to the previous algorithm that we've seen, but we are losing all of the information that we have discovered during uh, looking at our calibration problem, looking at the mathematical properties of our problem, and really enforce them. And if we found something, this will, this will always happen. If you start doing real measurements, you mess up correspondences, there's always some errors going on. And then you can find all of the errors that you did during your detection, or well, maybe not all, but many of the errors you do during the detection will actually be found by this algorithm, and then you have to recompute and kick out wrong correspondences. And then you get a good um, essential matrix. Very well. So now we have, as input data, two images of a patient with one camera, and we use point features. So we take one camera and move it, and we uh, assume that we have solved the correspondence problem. So we can now find the point um, in one image and in the other image. Uh, we, we know them. Yeah. Let's assume we have solved it. And what we further do is we normalize it uh, to homogeneous coordinates and set the third component to one. And we use a perspective projection. What we now still have to figure out is um, we have to consider the intrinsic parameters. So, so far, we have not considered at all the intrinsic parameters of our camera. And we can summarize them by the matrix K. And we remember that they uh, essentially describe the skew in between of your axis, the different pixel sizes, and the different location of the origin. So if it's on the top left. And you can also then um, describe a, a XY coordinate system. So this is the ideal coordinate system where you have the origin in the center of the optical ray. So this is the position where the central ray hits the, the screen. And now we change to the UV coordinate system, which is the real system, where we might have a skew angle in between, and where we have uh, different, different sizes uh, of our uh, X and Y pixel size. So what we can show now is that we can adopt our previous uh, selection. So we can use our K and convert our point I from a pixel point, we need to apply the inverse 
intrinsic parameters matrix to get our uh, homogeneous image point. And on the right hand side, if we uh, also if we have a pixel position in our image coordinate system, we need to apply the inverse camera matrix, uh, intrinsic yeah, camera matrix in order to get the homogeneous point. And if we do that and plug that into our original formulation of the essential matrix, what will happen is uh, that, of course, here the sequence changes because of the transpose. Then you get Q pixel position transpose times K to the, uh, so the inverse of K um, transpose times the essential matrix times K inverse times the homogeneous position of the pixel point. Okay? And now we can, let's assume we have the same camera, yeah, because we were only rotating and translating the camera. Then it needs to have the same uh, intrinsic parameters, so we only have one camera matrix K here, and then we can write up this as the so-called fundamental matrix. And now the fundamental matrix really operates on pixel positions and no longer on homogeneous points in an, in an ideal, idealized camera system. So what we actually uh, want to compute is the fundamental matrix if you are operating of, on pixel positions. And also F has rank 2. And it encodes the intrinsic and extrinsic parameters and maps uh, points again onto lines. So if you have F, you can use a pixel position in the one camera and compute the respective uh, epipolar line on the other camera. So this operates directly on pixel positions. And of course, also the epipolar uh, constraint holds. So if you have a, um, a point on the respective other line, then um, uh, this equation uh, needs to be zero. So where do we have that? Uh, anyway, good. Yeah, this is the uh, epipolar constraint for the fundamental matrix. So here we have the pixel position times the fundamental matrix times the other pixel position. And here we can use something, we can also use the eight-point algorithm. Now we directly put in pixel positions. We also need to find the null space here. And we will find that the rank of M is eight. So if we, we need eight equations actually to describe this matrix here. And this is, so we need eight correspondences of pixels to find the eight equations to form M. And then uh, this is the reason, of course, why this is called the eight-point algorithm. We can solve it with singular value decomposition. And of course, we also need to make sure that the rank of two, uh, uh, the rank of F equals to two. Typically, you have as a starting point um, a system, an uh, overdetermined system of equations. So you typically have more than eight points. And uh, F then lies in the null space of M. And you find, um, yeah, find it as the null space of M because rank is eight. Good. So we can do something very similar. So you may have to make sure that the last uh, singular value needs to be close to zero. If it's larger, then you can go to the, to the error case. Then you can enforce the same, essentially, as in the previous version of the eight-point algorithm. You can enforce the rank and um, uh, see that your fundament fundamental matrix um, has a last singular value greater, uh, equal to zero. Now, because we are operating Technically, on camera coordinates, we can no longer use the strict that a singular value 1 and 2 needs to be equal. Yeah? So we have a singular value 1, a singular value 2, and we cannot uh, enforce that they need to be the same because our pixel directions could be scaled differently. So this would then give you, in the end, the final, um, the final version of your rank-deficient fundamental matrix. Okay, now um, we have the problem that our image coordinates typically are defined with the top left of the corner, and coordinates uh, may vary from zero to a few hundred. And um, the third homogeneous coordinate is usually set to one. So this 
can cause a bit of instability. So what you often do is uh, you translate the origin of the image coordinate system to the centroid of your feature points, and you can use the tricks described here uh, to balancing the data, and then you get less numerical instability. But let's not go into too much detail in here. Okay, so um, if you now want to compute the, the rotation and translation, uh, you can see that, uh, let's assume, if you know the intrinsic uh, parameters, then you can immediately get the essential matrix, and then the essential matrix depends on the extrinsic parameters only. So if you have a calibrated camera where you know the intrinsic parameters, then you can also compute E. And here you would see how to compute actually E. Okay, good. And this, of course, you can also write this up with quaternions. I'm skipping over this because <clears throat> what you've seen so far is actually sufficient to implement um, a fundamental matrix. So you can uh, consider 3D scenes with the fundamental matrix. We can actually compute 3D, uh, we can co compute correspondences between one point and the other point, and we can use that to find matching points and dramatically reduce the search problem. So if you just have one point on, on, on one image, uh, then technically all of the other points in the other image could be corresponding. But if you have a calibrated fundamental matrix, you can narrow down the search, uh, search, space, search space just to a line. So this helps you to speed up the matching process for uh, finding 3D points and so on. Um, the epipolar constraint is linear in the components of E and F, and this uh, enables us a fast algorithm to find a fast algorithm that will give us immediately the solution from a set of calibration points. Yeah, and we discussed the numerically robust estimation of the essential matrix by property enforcement. And here, if you want to know more about that, um, there's also a very nice um, a book here, introduction, Introductory Techniques for 3D Computer Vision. Then, of course, uh, Hartley's book is, is very good, and uh, some background on magnetic navigation. Do you have any questions so far? Yes? Yes, uh, but you, make, you need to make sure that you have uh, yeah. yeah, yes. Yeah, so the reason why we are, we are looking into the essential matrix is because it helps us to understand the fundamental matrix better. So typically, you calibrate right away the fundamental matrix and then use it for the correspondence problem. Yeah. And uh, how does these two essential matrix and fundamental matrix, uh, matrix uh, how, how do they relate to catheter detection? To, to catheter detection? Yeah, so now that you have, so let's assume you have one point, then you know that the other point needs to be on a line, right? So I pick the tip of the catheter, then I only have this line to search for the other projection, and I'm also looking for the tip of the catheter, and I can hopefully do that automatically, match them with a kind of feature descriptor, and then I have two points. And if I have calibrated projection matrices, then I can use those two points to compute the intersection of the two projection rays. And the intersection of the two projection rays will give us the 3D point. But if I really want to compute a 3D point, um, uh, yeah, I, I can go down this way. Yeah, exactly. More questions? Yes? Yeah, it's also from the last lecture, and I must admit uh, that I 
skipped over it very quickly. It was defined. Oh, oh, it's not defined on the set of slides. Yeah, it was defined on the last uh, lecture. So it essentially describes the skew of the coordinates and also using a homography, the center point of the coordinate system that are, in, are the components of K. Huh? Exactly. Okay. Good. More questions? If that's not the case, I want to show you something which is, which is building on this, and it's really cool. So let's see if I can also get to full screen. Oh, it's because I'm, I am already in full screen. Good. Um, this is something that is somehow different from what you've seen so far, but it is actually very much related to epipolar geometry. And the thing that I want to point out here are consistency conditions in X-ray imaging. So, so far, what you've seen is uh, that we can use the same uh, kind of math to describe the X-ray projection system. Huh? And let's, let's go through and let's look at an example. Uh, the reason why this consistency metric is interesting is because if you have something that screws up your reconstruction, you can figure out where it is uh, actually related, uh, where it is actually located. So, in uh, in the first lecture in DMIP, we talked about the image reconstruction, and all of the time we have been assuming that the image is static. But if your image is not static, then motion, uh, typically your patient does some motion. Yeah? And if you have a longer image acquisition, the motion will screw up your data, uh, will screw up your data and you get pretty bad artifact. So for example, this is an MR image without motion and this is one with motion and you can see that it screws up the contrast and something uh, very similar also appears in CT. If you have motion in between, then um, you can find that the image will be very blurred and another, uh, one thing to remedy this is that you only se select um, a subset of projections that are taken in the same hard phase, but then you end up with very few projections and you get pretty bad streak artifacts. So typically what you do for motion compensation, and this is also what we will do later in this course, uh, we will apply motion compensation. So we will try to estimate the amount of motion and then do some kind of motion compensation by using a motion model. So for example, I could have a full 3D deformation field that describes the motion of my 3D volume and incorporate this into the reconstruction. Typically, this is very expensive and takes a lot of time. So the nice thing, if you're using this data consistency metrics that we will talk about now, is we can entirely compute this in projection domain. So we don't have to perform, typically if you want to do motion compensation, you run a reconstruction of one hard phase and the reconstruction of another hard phase, and then you do non-rigid registration, what we'll talk about later in this course. Then you estimate a motion field, and with this motion field, you then do a motion compensated reconstruction. So you have to do many passes of reconstruction and projection and so on. So this is quite expensive. And if we have a very simple motion, like a rigid body motion, we can already use um, data consistent matrix to compensate for them. There is a couple of different um, data consistency metrics. They've uh, been known in literature actually for quite some time. And just let me point out, um, they're ex extremely fast because I can compute them directly on the raw data. So I get a, essentially a checksum for every pair of projections. The downside is um, it only works for certain applications and uh, there's many results published, but I haven't seen this used actually uh, in practice so far. And so uh, by now there's actually one industry product that is actually doing a data consistency based motion correction. So, so, so this is a little slightly outdated because now there's also a product available that is actually using this. So there's now also real data results and I will short you, sh slow, I will short you, sorry, I will shortly show you uh, the idea 
what we can do there. Uh, this is an overview on data consistency conditions, and I don't think that we have to go through all of those, um, but we will only stick to the one that is relevant to the epipolar case. So I will skip over a couple of uh, slides, because the, the older ones that are, have already been around for quite some time is moments and sinograms and so on, but then we would have to repeat all of the reconstruction theory if we really want to go through there. But we will only look into the epipolar case here. So um, forget about this parallel moments and um, the sinogram Fourier properties. Uh, you can actually forget about this right now. Instead, um, let's talk a bit about the Radon transform. So if you think about what we are actually observing in an X-ray image, is that we have any ray that passes through our object here. This is our object. This is the ray passing through the object hitting here at the detector. What it will do is it will collect um, the absorption, or it will measure the absorption along this ray. And at this point, we have some start intensity, I0. And I0 times e to the power of minus the integral o along our ray. So we call this f of l. Uh, along the ray. So let's say L is uh, some function that is um, describing a ray through our object. And this will be the observation that we get at the detector. And now I can divide by um, I naught and apply the logarithm, which will make this cancel out. And I can multiply with minus 1, which will make, make this cancel out. And then I get the integral over our object on the domain of our line uh, integrated over the line. So in, the, in diagnostic medical image processing, we've been talking about this. Uh, so let's say this is the start intensity. So this will be from 0 uh, to infinity. Or let's say infinity is where the detector is. Um, <laughs> yeah. Good. You can also put the detector. Uh, anyway, we, we, will, we will have our detector in infinity. Okay, so let's define infinity at the point where the detector is. Good. So what we observe here is that if we write this up, we know this quantity because we measure it at the detector. We know this quantity because we, this is the two parameter. This is what, how we control the system. So we know all of this stuff here. So we can just write this as P. Uh, this is the projection, and this is measuring nothing else than the integral over our function here, f of l uh, dl. Okay. So this is essentially just measuring the sum along our ray. So all of our uh, absorption coefficients will be added up along this ray, and I'm just measuring an integral. Now, what you typically um, do in order to get an X-ray projection, in reconstruction theory, you often stay in the parallel case. And now let's stay in the parallel case and say we have rays that we are shooting through our object, and they're all measuring line integrals. And this is our object. OK, so what we typically do in order to perform the reconstruction, we rotate by 180 degrees. Then we sample all of the rays through the object. This gives us a large system of linear uh, equations, and then we solve it and get the reconstruction. And this set of observations is called the sinogram. Now we can also do this in the 3D case. And in the 3D case, um, you will realize that the Radon transform is not identical to the, the Radon transform is not identical to the X-ray transform. Because the X-ray transform would have a set, a 2D set of parallel, uh, so a plane of sources and a detector plane, and it would measure everything. So it would measure a 2D projection along parallel lines that are formed by a plane. So this would be the 3D X-ray transform, and this is not the 3D radon transform. The 3D radon transform is a projection of uh, onto a one-dimension 
lower, so it's a projection onto plane integrals. 3D radon transform, in 2D it's the same, the X-ray transform and the radon transform, because we are um, projecting onto, in, uh, we are projecting a plane over onto integration of lines, but in the 3D radon transform, we are projecting a volume onto sets of planes. So 3D radon transform is computing plane integrals. Just a refresher. But the nice thing is now, um, there is a relation between X-ray transform and radon transform. If you think about what will happen in such an X-ray projection image, and let's assume it's a parallel image, then I can get uh, the radon transform out of this X-ray transform. Because I can just sample all of the lines that, I, uh, that intersect with my object and I sample all of the lines that intersect with my object, and then I compute the integral over the line. Because if I do that, let's stay here in the 2D case, what I'm doing essentially is integrating into this direction. So my x-rays have measured already the integral in this direction, and now I'm integrating over this direction again. So what happens? If I first sum up all of the elements in this direction, this will give me a vector, and then I sum up all the elements of the vector. Yeah, so the direction will be eliminated, and I'm computing the integral of the entire slice. If first, I compute all the integrals in this direction, I get a vector, and I integrate up again, and then I get the integral of the entire slice. And of course, it doesn't matter if I do it this way, and then integrate in this direction or the other way around. I'm always getting the same number here. Because, yeah? And this also means uh, in 2D, if I take the sum over the entire projection image, I will always get the same value. And this is cool, right? Because then I already found a first consistency. So this way I have a consistency metric. The sum of the object must not change um, over entire 3D scan. If it changed, something has been different, so there is some inconsistency, and typically these inconsistencies also uh, do artifacts. Okay, so if we do this in a 2D parallel projection, if we start integrating over those lines, we are actually sampling the 3D radon transform, which is also interesting, um, but and you will see how those plane integrals become more handy in a perspective projection. So now we have the epipolar geometry, and of course it's the same here, so we don't know where the point X is. And if we had a second projection, then we know that this line connecting C0 and X0 needs to be, or will be projected onto L1 here. And of course this is also the same relation otherwise, so if we have a point x1 and uh, we project it and we connect it with c1, the connection of this thing here will form a line in here. In fact, all of our three points form a plane. And this is our plane, and now this is what I tried to, to describe earlier. If we move this point up and down, you see this? I'm moving the point, and this actually causes a tilt of my epipolar plane. But it's the same plane, okay? Now this is useful. Now I found lines that are corresponding, and they correspond to the same plane. Now if I think about that, um, I can actually find redundancies. And now the idea is, if I have the same epipolar plane, then I can go ahead and compute a line integral so all of these points, all the pixels in the projection, are already line integrals. Let's assume they are parallel. Let's assume our source is very far away. Then they are all parallel. Then we can show that if we integrate along this line, it must be the same integral if, as if we integrate along this line. That's cool, isn't it? So any epipolar line, and remember we can find many epipolar lines because we have this entire pencil of planes that will give us epipolar lines. Every epipolar line will be associated with a value that is identical to the integral over the plane intersecting the object, the epipolar plane intersecting the object at this point. 
Oh, that's cool. We, we just intrinsically found out that our, that our X-ray measurement, any two pair of X-ray projections, has a checksum. And this checksum, checksum is our epipolar consistency because the planes need to add up. That's really useful. Now, if I have a rigid, a rigid body motion, for example, I can find the movement parameters such that I return to the original optimal, um, to the optimal consistency. So I can start figuring out a motion in 3D that will uh, return or will optimize the consistency in the projection uh, for rigid body motions. Remember, important for this is the entire object must fit the detector. If you have objects that exceed the detector, all of this doesn't add up anymore because we need to observe the entire object. Otherwise, if we have truncation, if the object doesn't fit the detector, all of the line integrals don't make, make sense anymore because truncation is intrinsically inconsistent. There's another thing that I have not told you so far. Um, and this is not true for fan and cone beam geometry because our, our source is not very far away and we actually have a fan. And now if you think about that, uh, if you have a figure like this and an object like this, um, then you will realize that every point, so the, the distance here and the distance here is further away. So you get an inconsistent weighting because of the fan beam geometry. Uh, here, you, if, you set, if you integrate along here, those points in, at this part of the ray and the points at this part of the ray, they're not at the same distance. And this means that we introduce a weighting because we don't have equal size. So the fan beam destroys everything. So there's no consistency if we are using a fan beam geometry for plane integrals because we introduce a weighting. Too bad. Now we have all this wonderful consistency and we just figured out uh, that it doesn't work because we have a weighting. But luckily there's a trick and this trick is called Granjat's uh, theorem and Granja. Uh, he is actually showing that if you uh, transform from fan beam, uh, from parabeam to fan beam, you get this weighting here. So this is weighted with the determinant of the Jacobian. This is the weight that I just tried to introduce here. This is introduced by the change of coordinates because you're changing the direction of the rays. So you get a weighted integral. But now you can introduce the normal direction. So this is our, if this is the plane, our epipolar plane, we're doing the normal direction. So this is out of the, out of the board. Now we introduce the normal direction as n, and we're computing the derivative with respect to the normal direction of the plane. And if we do that, uh, you can actually show that the derivative with respect to the normal direction is approximately the same as the derivative with respect to the direction projected onto the detector. So if you project the normal onto the detector and then compute the derivative in normal direction of the epipolar line, then you can actually um, see that those two are similar. And this is nice. And the other thing that is very nice is if you, if you start computing this derivative, you're taking out the weighting. So actually, the, the weight in, in between two neighboring epipolar planes, yeah? if you think about it, the weighting here, and let's assume you have one plane that is only slightly off into normal direction, they will have a very similar weighting, almost the same. And if you do the, a small angle approximation, then you will actually find uh, that this, this weight almost cancels out, uh, up to approximation. So if you compute the derivative of your line integrals, or plane integrals, actually they're plane integrals, yeah? weighted plane integrals as soon as you have a fan beam direction. And now you're computing a derivative uh, with respect to the epipolar line or plane uh, 
direction, you cancel out this weighting, and suddenly we have our consistency measure again. So we can use Gronchardt's trick, and we have consistency measure again. And now we can do a couple of applied examples. Because now we have identified that we have this wonderful uh, tool of epipolar uh, geometry, and the epipolar geometry allows us to describe the orientation of the epipolar lines, depending on the camera orientations. And what I've shown here is, this is one projection from one view, and this is another projection from another view, and it's showing a calibration phantom. Now, the interesting thing is, these are epipolar lines, and in green, are the epipolar lines on the right-hand side, and on blue are the epipolar lines on the left-hand side. And now in the center, you find the integral along the epipolar line, and then the derivative in normal direction. And you can find that those two curves, can you actually see it? The blue and the green curve, they're very similar. And you can actually see that those two are almost in the same position, but they're slightly off. Can you see this huge jump here? So this is slightly off. So now you can use two projections that have almost parallel epipolar lines, and you can use this one, for example, to estimate the difference in, in Z direction. So you, if you shift the phantom up and down, you will see that the two lines will immediately um, start to, uh, to go away. So if I start moving this phantom downwards, it's, uh, I'm also moving uh, the plot in the center downwards. Another observation you can make here is, if I start moving my phantom to the left or to the right, I won't see any change in this line integral. Because if I move along the integration direction, there's no change in the integrals. So if I pick two projections where I almost have parallel, uh, almost parallel epipolar lines, I will be able to observe a shift in this direction very well because it will introduce a very high difference in between uh, the matching function here. But if I start shifting within the integration direction, there's no difference because the integrals will always sum up. Now this is an interesting observation. And Actually, if you look at the parameter stability is, uh, if I shift now in the u direction here, uh, I can, s so if I, so the v direction is up and down. Yeah? If I sh shift up and down, I can see that the cost function increases. So there's a big increase in cost function. But if I shift in u direction, there's no change because we're shifting along the integration direction. So for this close pair, the function is not very good for uh, translations along U. Now, I can also use this to compose. Actually, I can use now this to select few, to select projections that are very useful to establish a correspondence between the projections. And I, I can derive a full epipolar consistency metric. And uh, of course, I need the fundamental matrix and the epipoles. Then I can uh, select seed points in the reference image. I can compute the lines in the referent, uh, referent image and in the other image, and I can use I can compute the integrals along those lines, and then I compute the derivative, and I can find the two functions that describe the derivative along uh, the normal direction, and then I can match the two. And this is essentially written down as an equation here. Very well. Now I can also. Uh, see that I can find uh, the, the derivative of the radiant transform here. So this is just the derivation along the normal direction in the integral domain of the lines. So this is a radon transform of our projection image. And here is the original projection image. This is the sampling points. These are the sampling points. These are the corresponding epipolar lines. In radon space, they will lie on this line. And uh, I can do the same for the other projection. Uh, you can think about the radon space uh, and uh, sinogram domain. Anyway, uh, then you can find two corresponding lines. 
and they are highlighted by the bold lines here. So these are two are corresponding, and I can other corresponding lines. We can find them here. Now let's look at a circular trajectory. Here I can find lines. If I have a source position that is very close together, I will get epipolar lines that are almost parallel. If I select projections that are different by about 120 degrees, all of my epipolar lines must, of course, go through my, my two uh, my two camera centers, and the epipole will be here. So the epipole will be way out of the image plane. But they are no longer, they are no longer parallel. If they are very, very close together, the epipole will be almost at infinity. Yeah? Now I can go ahead and move them closer, uh, and, and move them at an angle of 120 degrees, and you'll see that the epipolar lines change to change, and now you can get even closer and closer. And if I have two opposite views, I will even get the case that the epipole is in the center. Now, if you consider this case, um, you will immediately realize that you can now determine shifts in u and v direction, because it both will be useful. Both will be detected in this projection. So now I can think about that. and not only think about a, a circular trajectory, but arbitrary X-ray positions, and think about how I have to position projections in order to be able to detect shifts and rotations optimally, such that I can optimize for consistency. So let's summarize. We can use the epipolar lines and epipolar geometry to think about our consistency measure. We can use it to select projections. And we can use the epipole position to estimate um, in which directions our consistency metric will be useful or not. And then, of course, you have to think about the sampling in radon sp uh, space. And uh, yeah, we've seen that the epipole uh, moves on the line. OK. Optimization. Yeah. Yeah. So ideally, you would sample random positions on a sphere around the object, but typically this is not available. But you can start sampling, for example, a, a triangular region with three projections, and then you already get a much more stable orientation uh, uh, motion estimate. Another thing that you have to keep in mind, of course, the position at the bottom right, the 180 degrees position, this is also in your scanning procedure. It's very far away. So it took a lot of time to move to this position. So this is also prone to have a lot of difference between the two. And then you have to find an optimization strategy that optimizes all of the consistency over the entire scan, such that you have an optimal position of your object. And then you can actually get a motion compensated reconstruction for rigid body motion only using projection data. And this is very, very fast. And you can almost get, do it in, without any additional, well, there's additional computations. But this is really fast and uh, does not add a lot to the computation time. So yeah. this is also very cool for interventional applications. Imagine you have a patient on the table, and he has a stroke. And you did not fix him. And he has a, is suffering a seizure. He will, rotate, he will move his head. And with methods like this, you can compensate for the motion and still reconstruct a beautiful 3D image. OK, so uh, just a word about this. Uh, this was maybe slightly more complicated than typically what we use epipolar geometry in. But I think it's a very nice observation. The theory of plane integrals, Grandjard's trick, all of these things have been around for, for quite some time. Yeah? Also, epipolar uh, geometry has been around uh, for a long time. But it's quite interesting that you can combine all of those to gain new insights. So at the, all of this that I've shown to you today, the theory is, longer, is around longer than 20 years. But you can nicely assemble this and uh, then come up with nice ideas for motion compensation. And this is also something which is very interesting if you're working as an engineer, if you're working in research, that you can look at the theory nicely, combine them, and bring them to your application. Good. 
And we are using actually computer vision methods now and uh, reconstruction methods in order to, der to derive this consistency metric. And it works on any pair of X-ray images. It will work on any pair of X-ray images. So if you have an application that has two or more um, projection images, you can immediately compute this kind of consistency metric. Okay, do you have any questions? I hope this was not too confusing. There was a, there's, there's a lot of equations on the slides. Yes? Yeah, and I, I can, yes, I can tell. I can tell you that uh, the the epipolar geometry will be important for the exam, and um, it may be useful uh, if you stick to the things that I've I've written here on the board. You have to know that uh, an X-ray is a is a line integral and stuff for that, and. It will be sufficient if you know that if you have a parallel geometry and you compute the integration along the ray and in a perpendicular direction, you will always get the same integral. And the trick with the, with the derivation in the fan direction. Yeah. You, you have, if you have a, a understanding how to compute it, it will be sufficient. You don't have to derive it. The, the, what I want to convey here is that the, the theory may be to derive everything, may be fairly difficult, but if you actually want to implement this, um, it's not that hard. You compute your integrals along the epipolar lines and uh, into a direction perpendicular, so this, this is doable. Yeah. So everybody in this class at the, at the end of the term should be able to, to actually implement something like this. Uh, don't don't learn the derivation because if we go through the full derivation, I have to repeat like of half of the previous course, so I won't repeat this. But uh, it's it's sufficient um, that you get the understanding how to compute it. And of course, the eight-point algorithm will be very relevant. Yeah, you should be aware of the eight-point algorithm, the different steps. You should know how you can derive the essential matrix difference between essential matrix and fundamental matrix. And then, um, yeah, of course, you should be able to sketch the entire stereo system. What is an epipolar plane? What's an epipolar line? And uh, what is the, um, the epipolar constraint? Yeah? That if you take two points that uh, match to the same world point, that if you multiply them with the essential matrix, it needs to be zero. And if, if you select one point in the one image, it will be able, you will be able to compute the line in the other image. So these are the things that you, you should take uh, also to the written exam. Uh, but you don't have to be able to derive the epipolar uh, consistency metric. This is something which, is, which we are doing in research in, in our lab. Yeah? But it's something that you, if you follow this lecture, you can see that uh, the stuff we are, we are doing in, in research it's not that far away. Yeah. So if you attended this lecture and the previous lecture, you can already follow one, one of our recent research results. This is also the point that we want to emphasize here in the lecture, that we present things that are relevant to current research topics. And you can go, so this is actually pub published by Andre Eichert. He has a very nice paper in TMI from last year and uh, you can read up the entire derivation and so on. And it's actually a very good read. So after following this class, you can go ahead and download the paper from our website and, and read it, and you will be able to follow it. This is the point that I want to make clear with this one. We won't ask for equation 24 in the written exam. In Eichert's paper, equation 10, 24, can you comment on it? No, this won't be a question of the written exam. Yeah. Okay, more questions? Yes? Yes. <laughs> when exactly Oh, uh, we just published it on our website. Um, I think you didn't find it? J July 19? Yes, it's already published on my campus, right? If you're registered on my campus, you also know it. Um, yeah. 
But if, if it's not on the web page now, we will publish it uh, at least until tomorrow. And I don't have the time yet. I just have the date. Is the, is the time in my campus? No. No. Typically not. Is everybody fine with the date of the exam? Yeah, hopefully. Because if, if you're not, there's nothing I can do about it. <laughs> yes? Uh, maybe you can ask that after the, the lecture. Is, is that okay? Unless you want your, your question recorded on video. If that's all, then uh, let's conclude today's lectures. Thank you.